Thank you for joining us today. Pleased to have you here. Um, this morning we have an important discussion on recent trends on, in combating corruption in Latin America. Today is a joint collaboration between ASCOA and America's Quarterly and features the new Capacity to Combat Corruption Index. The CC Index was developed by ASCOA and the prominent risk consultancy Control Risks presented in the latest issue of America's Quarterly, which you will find at your seats. We are grateful for our strong partnership with Control Risks and also very appreciative of the sponsorship of this morning's discussion. Our Miami program sponsors, Chevron, Cisco, Microsoft, NBC Universal, are strong partners of ours. With us today as our moderator and speaker is our very own Roberto Simon, Senior Director for Policy at ASCOA, head of our anti-corruption working group, and politics editor for America's Quarterly. I'd also like to give a warm welcome to our other speakers, Geert Albers with COA member Control Risks, and Susan Clancy with Inkai Business School, also a COA member and a strong partner of ASCOA. Before I turn it over to Roberto, I just want to let you know that we have an unusual format this morning. The first half will be presentations that we are going to film and place on our website. Um, this will allow this important discussion to be shared um, with, the, with the greater public. And then after the presentations, Roberto um, will um, moderate a um, off-the-record Q&A with all of you. So thank you again for joining us. And Roberto, over to you. Well, first of all, Nancy, thank you so much for helping us organize this and, and for the partnership uh, with, with AQ, with, with our anti-corruption working group. Um, before we start presenting the index, and I think uh, we'll have a very interesting discussion here, we wanted to invite Susan Clancy from Inkai to also give her perspective on the fight against corruption and how it intersects with, with business and the regulatory environment throughout Latin America. But before we do that, I would like to say a few words about the anti-corruption working group. Uh, for very specific reasons, the council decided to focus on the issue of anti-corruption. Um, corruption has been, of course, a major problem for Latin America, undermining growth, undermining democracy, undermining human rights for a long time. But we've started seeing something different in 2014, 2015, which was, for the first time, really powerful people began going to jail because of corruption. And this was happening in places like Brazil, with Lava Jato, and then all the older brush investigations in places like Colombia, uh, Peru, of course, but also in, in, I would say, unexpected corners of Latin America, such as Guatemala with CICIG, Chile uh, with, with major uh, cases like uh, Caval, like uh, SQM. Um, and in many ways, uh, um, you know, this dramatically affects how companies operate in the region, right? It's also a matter, it's a matter of compliance systems, of trying to understand how you cope with this new reality, but it's also from a political risk perspective, and kind of this is where I come from, these major changes or major operations tend to trigger big regulatory changes, a big political uncertainties. They try to shape elections, and we've seen this in places like Mexico with AMLO, in Brazil with Bolsonaro, even in, in, in Colombia last year uh, in the elections uh, with the emergence of, of uh, Petro, uh, and now to a lesser extent in places like Argentina where you have a candidate uh, for vice president who faces several accusations of corruption. Um, one of our commitments is to sophisticate the discussion that we have about corruption, to try to understand better uh, how countries are trying to build their capacity to fight corruption. Uh, and from the Council of the Americas, we're doing this in several ways. We're tr trying to look at specific cases and, and do case studies on reforms in Chile or how you know, the dynamics of corruption at the local level in Peru are. Uh, we're also doing cases now in Mexico and Brazil. Uh, we're ramping up our coverage of corruption in America's Quarterly, we have an anti-corruption column. This issue was entirely dedicated, almost entirely dedicated, to the state now, the fight against corruption and the threats to the advancements that we had in, in, uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, and also a big, big part of the effort is the capacity to combat corruption index. Uh, 
Um, Gert was our partner in this uh, effort with control risks. We relied extensively on control risks analysts and on Gert, you know, enormous expertise on the subject, uh, having worked for quite some time in the region. So he'll, he'll start presenting the CCC index. I'll make a few remarks afterwards, and then we'll hear from Susan with her perspective, doing a lot of research on how anti-corruption impacts uh, the business environment. So let me give you the clicker. Thank you. Thank you, Gert. So good morning, everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's um, I mean, it's not very often that I come through Miami, although we do a lot of work across Latin America. Probably should be coming here more often. Um, very warm welcome. It is indeed a warm and muggy day. Um, and also to my colleagues, Greg and Laura. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for the invitation um, for control risks. It's been, uh, uh, I mean, for me personally, and an institution for control risks has been incredibly rewarding working with Council of the Americas and with Holberto in particular. Um, I think we complement each other very well. We provoke each other, and we <laughs> kind of get to, I think, some sensible outcome of the discussion in, in our discussions. Um, today, right? <laughs> I did, yeah, that's right. We'll see some of that today. Uh, what I want to briefly do is um, talk to you, or at least present, uh, you know, what the CCC is and why we did it. And then Roberto, I think, can fill in on, you know, the, the methodology and ultimately what we found. So um, rewinding a little bit, in 2016, um, we, you know, we have offices, Control Risk has offices in Brazil. Um, I run the Brazil office. We have offices in Mexico and Colombia. And we're getting, uh, starting to get some calls from law firms uh, in particular, um, starting to see some rumblings in Argentina, wondering whether Argentina was going to have its own car wash. Um, and uh, it was... Um, it was kind of a, you know, it, it was very difficult to categorically respond yes or no. Um, quite frankly, uh, there were some indications that enforcement would start taking hold, but it wasn't very clear. And so we penned an article uh, in 2016, which quite frankly, I think, was more artistic than scientific. But uh, rather than being very speculative about the movement, we, Together with a, with an analyst, we kind of looked at some of the uh, some of the criteria which we thought made Brazil successful in combating in, uh, corruption, um, and compared those between Argentina and Brazil. And we kind of came to the conclusion at the time that Argentina was still quite far behind Brazil. And I think Argentina has made some strides forward, but they probably still are quite far behind. We'll see that in the index itself and the results. But as I said, that was a very you know one off effort. It wasn't particularly scientific in any shape or form. Um, and then when Council of the Americas launched uh, the Anti-Corruption Working Group in 2018 after a very successful conference uh, earlier in 2018, um, you know, we decided uh, together uh, in that working group that we would try and do something across Latin America, obviously with much more robust methodology um, and uh, comparing ultimately 90% of the economies in, in uh, Latin America. So we looked at Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Peru, Mexico, Venezuela, and Guatemala being the largest Central American economy, but also because there are some interesting developments in Guatemala, which I think other countries could learn from, um, and maybe now not learn from anymore. So um, uh, the, uh, I think the, 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 the index itself, um, the, the idea behind the index was really to provide another, at least there are two, I would say two key objectives. One, as Holbert already alluded to, to foster a much more robust debate about corruption risk and how to combat corruption generally. The other one was from you know, a more corporate perspective perhaps to offer companies another data point to try and understand corruption and corruption risk. And I say this because our purpose, and I think we've been reasonably successful in that endeavor. Obviously, this is a developing methodology, and your input's very welcome, and we'll take that on board next year when we go and tackle the globe. No, we're just doing a couple more countries in Latin America, probably. But the, um, the, the, the main data point most companies have been using is obviously Transparency International Perception Index. Um, one of our concerns, I think shared concerns in the beginning, was when we launched this index, we certainly didn't want to put it out in the market as a substitute. Um, I think that would be pretentious, and it's not even necessary. There's so little information about corruption generally, 
um, that there's plenty of room for more information. And uh, what we thought would be helpful is to try and assess what um, you know the capacity of uh, uh, countries to combat corruption, meaning their capacity to uncover, to punish, and to deter corruption, as opposed to uh, looking at the perception index. And we know from experience, and I'm sure you know uh, uh, people here in this room as well. We know from experience that reading and depending exclusively on a perception index, for example, um, can lead to mis uh, it can lead to a misleading conclusions. And that's not because there's something wrong with the index itself, but it's because maybe we're reading too much into the perception index. Given that perception is a proxy for reality, assuming that you know the index suggests that corruption is, for example, in Brazil or has in Brazil gone, you know, uh, well, the, the rankings in Transparency International from uh, 69 in 2014 before car wash to 105 in last year's index, so that's a pretty steady and linear decline. Uh, if you interpret that meaning that corruption's gotten worse in Brazil, which is a pretty easy conclusion to take, although I think it's a wrong one, um, and certainly I don't think that's what Transparency International is stating, then you kind of come to wrong conclusions as to how you should tackle and which country should be priority and where you should have most concerns when you're looking at corruption across Latin America. So the uh, index, as I mentioned, is an index that's focused on assessing countries' capacity to combat corruption. The, um, the outcome and the methodology I'll leave to Roberto, um, but the idea we have is obviously we launched the index, it was tremendously uh, successful. Um, here's a little bit of the, what I'd previously mentioned, Brazil's rankings, um, you know, 69 through to 105. I think this beamer is going on Roberto's head, but I'm trying to point at the presentation here. <laughs> Sorry, I hope it doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, you'll see uh, Argentina, uh, in TI's rankings, have gone from 106 to 85. So again, the conclusion there, has Argentina gotten better? Has it become a more transparent environment? I, mm, I don't know how many of you work in Argentina, but I think that would also be a bit of a stretch conclusion. Um, and again, I think that would be the wrong conclusion to draw from TI's uh, ratings. Um, you'll see that in the capacity to combat uh, corruption, Argentina fares sort of in the middle, uh, so probably better than they would have about two years ago because there were some institutional developments there, but they're um, still very much developing their capacity. Um, and then Mexico, where I think the story might be reasonably coherent, um, you see uh, you know, the perception, uh, Mexico slipping in the perception index, um, suggesting that there's probably some pretty endemic corruption there. And when we look at the capacity to combat corruption, you also see that they scored pretty low. Um, so, you know, the outlook for uh, combating corruption in Mexico, we're still not very bullish about. And as a result, we'll probably see, continue to see, um, you know, pretty uh, entrenched and systemic corruption continuing in Mexico unless there's some significant changes. And we can open that up for discussion afterwards. But anyway, that was the kind of mindset behind putting the index together. Um, what did we expect when we launched this? Well, we're, I guess, a little ambivalent about the whole thing. We were hopeful that it would be received very well. Um, we were expecting um, a whole range of different, uh, I guess, reactions. Um, we uh, weren't certainly expecting that it would have such a massive pickup, particularly in media, um, in uh, civil society, um, even governments. and. Uh, to illustrate that we we um, uh, this is just the you know some of the news reporting that's been much much more but it, it, basically the the index was reported in pretty much all the main papers um, El, uh, El Tempo in Colombia El Comercio in Peru you'll see Valor Economico in Brazil uh, the trophy for Council of the Americas is this one here at a Farma first page front page. And it was quite interesting to see how the media responded because in Brazil the media responded oh finally some good news for Brazil because everyone keeps telling us how, you know, how we've been slipping in the Transparency International ratings. And when we're on the ground, we know that Brazil's actually doing something. There are a lot of risks in Brazil, which we can share and we'd like to discuss with you. But there's no doubt that Brazil has absolutely been one of the star performers in combating corruption in Latin America. In Mexico, the result was quite interesting as well. Um, in Mexico, it was like, look, see how bad we are? This is exactly what we needed to hear from someone independent coming in and assessing our situation. Um, and that was kind of the story in uh, Reforma. 
So uh, uh, very interesting, I think, and, and uh, rewarding, um, uh, I guess, exposure uh, in media. And also we've had uh, some pretty good um, you know, feedback from companies. There are a lot of questions. The methodology, as uh, Roberto will explain now, is uh, work in progress. There are things we could add. Um, there are things we will refine, uh, both in terms of you know, the variables we looked at. We looked at 14 variables, um, uh, but also the sources we used for that particular work. But it's a pretty good first stab, I think, at what we intended to do. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Roberto, um, and then uh, obviously, any time, feel free to ask questions. Okay. Thank you, Gert. Uh, if you can, can, maybe it's better. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the methodology, right? So an easy way for, for us to explain what we're trying to do here is to say what we're not trying to do, right? As Gert pointed out, we're not trying to measure levels of corruption or how corrupt the country is. We're not trying to measure the, Im the economic impact of corruption, right? How, many mu how, much, how much money you lose from corruption. And we're not trying to measure perception of corruption. Uh, what we're, we're trying to look at is countries' tools to detect, uh, to punish, and to prevent corruption, right? Uh, and how you do that? We basically looked at 14 different uh, uh, variables divided in three major categories, right? One that we call legal capacity, which includes things like judicial independence and efficiency, the quality of your anti-corruption agencies, um, do you have strong uh, channels for international collaboration, which has proven to be key in cases like Lava, Lava Jato and elsewhere? Can you trace money internationally if it goes to Europe over here in the United States? How much you cooperate with DOJ? Um, what are the tools you have in terms of collaboration, plea deals, etc.? What is in the books? Is it enforced? Is it not? Uh, the level of expertise you have uh, for prosecutors, federal police, when it comes to white collar crime. Then we, we have a second category which we called democracy and political institutions, right? Uh, and we look at specific things like the relationship between money and politics, um, so the quality of campaign financing laws or, or lobbying systems, is lobbying regulated, how so? Uh, did we face you know, major issues when it comes to, to the relationship between the private sector and the public sector, and the overall quality of democracy. And the third uh, category is civil society, media, and the private sector, which we, where we look at you know, how many NGOs dedicated to the issue of corruption exist. Are they good? Are they doing some serious work? Or are they kind of okay? Uh, do we have an active press, and this goes beyond having freedom of the press. When it comes to like specific media outlets, do they have investigative journalists? Are they able to publish a piece on a person accused of corruption, regardless of this person's political orientation? These are the questions that we're looking at. And also education, which we think is absolutely key for the fight against corruption. All the way from lev literacy levels to the quality of law schools forming you know, future law enforcement agents, future lawyers working in compliance, or you know, attorneys uh, working in the private sector as well. And how you measure that, right? It's, it, we, once we define the 14 variables, the key question for us is, can we find the right data to assess them? And we devised um, a dual approach here. Uh, okay, let me go back. So we, we devised the dual approach. First, we have hard data from renowned institutions like the World Bank, WEF, uh, Harvard Electro Prog uh, Project for, uh, Harvard Electro Project for just, uh, what was it? Harvard Electro? It's uh, Pippa Norris, a, a, a distinguished professor at Harvard, at Harvard who evaluates specific uh, uh, aspects of campaign financing, the quality of elections, et cetera. Uh, World Justice Report. We look at these very renowned institutions that are producing data that can be related to the, 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 the issue of anti-corruption. But we also understood that for these very specific questions, there was insufficient data. Right when it came to the, the quality of law schools in, in Argentina or in Colombia and Brazil, we would need something else. And that's when we decided to prepare a survey questionnaire uh, that would be uh, implemented in all countries 
to two different pe experts on anti-corruption. One coming from control risks, uh, usually a person involved in investigations, compliance, and who has been you know, following the story of anti-corruption from very close. Uh, and the other person uh, coming from an external network of experts uh, from academia, uh, civil society, the private sector, including attorneys working in compliance, uh, and journalists, uh, and they would be answering the same survey, right? And we created a methodology that these variables, they have uh, uh, different weights, right? Some of them are more important. We believe, for instance, that judicial independence and efficiency is extremely important for the fight against corruption in the region. And we certainly believe that digital communication and social media is important, but not as important as, as uh, the first uh, uh, the first variable. So with that, uh, we created this uh, methodology, and I can discuss the details if you have uh, specific questions. Um, so basically, what we have here is that this is important, right? Countries with higher scores, again, doesn't mean that they are less corrupt. It doesn't mean that they're facing you know, lower economic impacts of corruptions. It means that they're more likely to uncover corruption, they're more likely to punish corruption, and they're more likely to prevent corruption, right? Uh, and of course, lower scores uh, are, uh, represent the opposite. Um, so this is the overall score, right, w what we got. So basically, Chile is the number one country with 6.66, then Brazil. Uh, out of 10, right. <laughs> out of 10, then Brazil, uh, then Colombia and Argentina in a, a virtual tie, right? Uh, then Peru, Mexico, Guatemala, and Venezuela in a very distant uh, last place. As Gerd mentioned, we needed to make a decision on what countries we were covering for this first edition. Uh, we decided to use uh, a, an objective criterion, which was the size of their economy and the biggest uh, uh, economy in Central America, right? And with that, we're covering something like 90% of Latin America's GDP. Um, so we, we're not including countries that are very interesting, like Panama, like Ecuador, like uh, Paraguay. But we decided to focus on this one, or on these countries. And then when you, you break into the three categories that we were discussing, right? Legal capacity, democracy, and political institutions, civil society, media, and the private sector, you have you know, a more specific view, I would say. You would see, for instance, that you know, the overall, when it comes to the overall score, score, Chile is actually doing its number one. But when you look specifically at legal capacity or countries' legal tools to fight corruption, actually Brazil is doing a little better than Chile. And what we mean by that is that if you look at plea bargain legislation, the, 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 the channels for international cooperation, how much the country has been cooperating with authorities here in the United States and in Europe, or um, how well trained are the prosecutors, et cetera, Brazil is marginally better uh, than Chile, it's better than Argentina and the other countries as well. However, if you look at you know, democracy and political institutions, which we also think it's absolutely key for the fight against corruption, um, Argentina is doing better than Brazil, significantly, right? Uh, and it's also doing better than, than Colombia, than Peru, than Mexico. Argentina is only behind Chile. Uh, and with that, I think it's interesting because we can kind of separate the discussion. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the extreme case, obviously Venezuela is well, well behind uh, all countries in the three categories, but, you know, when you look at the private sector, civil society, and the media in Venezuela, it's not as bad as the other two, right? Legal capacity and uh, political, uh, democracy and political institutions. Um, so this is, these are, we, we have the, the full reports here available. They're also available online, and I'm happy to go through uh, the results for each country. I think we could save that also for the Q&A session. Uh, but basically, we looked at each country and try to understand why we got this result. And we also you know, try to, to have a more forward-looking uh, forward view on what people should be looking at, right? Particular trends. For instance, Brazil this week will likely chose, choose the, the next uh, chief prosecutor. Uh, 
uh, there's a lot of talk in Brazil about Bolsonaro choosing someone who's seen as aligned with his interests, and this would certainly impact uh, impact uh, Brazil's standing in the index, right? Cap the independence of the chief prosecutor and his, his or her resources are absolutely key for our country's uh, score in the index. Uh, but also for Argentina, we have elections now, for Mexico, there are big questions relating to the future of the Odebrecht investigation. We're seeing senior people uh, in Mexico recently uh, were arrested, uh, involved in, in the Peña Neto administration, um, and 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 that's it. We're excited about the results. As Geert was was mentioning, this is year one. I think for now we have an interesting comparative map. That can, you know, uh, offer us some some ideas on the state of of uh, the fight against corruption in the region. Starting in year two, so for 2020, we're gonna include more countries, but I think it will also be interesting to look at the trajectories of specific countries, right? And then we will start having a discussion, you know, if Colombia passes a legislation uh, preventing companies to donate money. I'm, I'm making this up, but let's say it changes. Uh, campaign financing rules, to what extent it will impact uh, its standing on, on the CCC index. Or if, you know, there's a chief prosecutor who's perceived as biased. Uh, these are questions that we'll be looking at. And at the end, our intention here is not to shame countries or say, you know, you're doing a bad job, but it's to propose a much more policy-oriented discussion uh, when it comes to fight, fighting corruption, right? When you look at countries that made significant progress, what was important for them? Uh, and is the media focusing on r wrong things, right? Uh, in an age with uh, overwhelming information from Twitter, Facebook, and other uh, things, can we focus on what really matters and what really can move the needle in fighting corruption? I just want to yep. compliment one point there, um, uh, kind of getting back to what I originally mentioned. For companies, the idea, at least, of, you know, interpreting this data um, is to have something which can potentially be more forward-looking. So under the assumption that a higher capacity to combat corruption actually translates into combating corruption, because, again, we, we're measuring the capacity, not necessarily what uh, uh, countries are doing, although there is a bit of a correlation there. Um, the assumption is that the environment for companies should change for the better, so more transparent, in, uh, more transparent environment. So for compliance officers or legal counsel or counsel sitting you know, outside Brazil or even inside Brazil, that's interesting to know. Look, is Brazil looking on the up or on the down? It's also super important to be very objective here for companies who have operations uh, in some of these countries where they may uncover issues. And we've seen lots of companies respond differently. Some of them simply don't do anything and hope the problem goes away. Others um, you know, make a, a concerted effort to uncover but shy away from disclosure simply because they figure it creates a bigger headache uh, than it does resolve the problem. And again, I'm not making, giving legal advice here, but there are different considerations. But in, in countries like Brazil, for example, which obviously I'm most familiar with, the calculus for companies changes quite dramatically when you know that there's significant combating of corruption, uh, when, uh, when particularly tools like leniency uh, and uh, exchange of information with authorities are, are so uh, pervasive and, and used in such, to such an intense degree, uh, the calculus for companies and their decision-making changes as well. So we, we really wanted to make sure that um, you know, the data gets used. It's not the only bit of data, as I mentioned, but as another bit of data point you know, for when companies take decisions, where to invest, where to disclose, and other considerations. So thanks, uh, Robert. Can you hear me? I'll pass to Susan, and I think Susan has been involved with the anti-corruption working group from the beginning, I would say, uh, giving precious uh, in input and, and uh, helping us out. Uh, but it I, we decided to invite Susan because of her enormous expertise on the subject, but because you're also looking at something slightly different than we are, right? So can give us your thoughts, and, and thank you again for, for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Can you hear me? Is this on? I'm so loud normally that I don't like talk. Well, I'll do it. I kind of <laughs> feel like a Justin Bieber or something. Um, so... I do have a different perspective. In fact, I don't think of myself as an expert at all. You're all experts in fighting corruption. 
what I'm doing is I'm on the ground trying to take what you've learned about fighting corruption and bring it to the business leaders and future leaders that we train at Inkai. So we're a business school that was founded uh, in the 1960s. Uh, the baby of State Department money, Harvard Business School, and business leaders in Latin America. And our mission is to promote development in the region. Um, consistent with promoting development in the region is fighting corruption. Because corruption, as you're going to see, and you probably already know, is clearly linked to competitiveness at a country level. The issue that I face is that the leaders that we teach and the students that are going to become leaders don't necessarily understand why corruption is important. And even if they do, they don't understand what you do about it. And there's very much a woe is me attitude that you hear, you know, throwing the hands up in the hair, there's nothing we can do, this is built into the DNA of a culture, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've been trying to do, and I'm so honored to be part of Council of the Americas and be able to get your help and your expertise in doing this, is what we're trying to do is raise awareness within the business sector in Latin America now remember, you're multinationals, so you're dealing with multinationals. You're way ahead of the curve in terms of understanding the importance of compliance, what the laws are, and the regulations. The majority of the small businesses and regional businesses have absolutely no idea. And in fact, the first thing you'll hear when you do training down there is that corruption is good. And why is corruption good? Because we're still in the greasy wheel theory, that in countries that don't have good infrastructure, that are inefficient, et cetera, you need corruption. So that was the first big shock, is that you're looking at often very high-level business leaders from all over Latin America who still have embedded in them that this is an issue of morality. And this is an issue of being good. It's not an issue of being good. This is an issue of making money. And they don't seem to understand it. So the first thing we have to do in terms of training is raise awareness that there is a clear relationship between perceptions of corruption, so if we're looking at Transparency International, and competitiveness as measured by whatever measure of competitiveness you want to look at. Number two, let's say you don't like the measures of competitiveness. Let's just look at GDP. This is the relationship between GDP and uh, country levels of perceived corruption. This is stunningly clear relationship. Very unusual in social sciences to have this kind of relationship. It's totally clear. And then for the students who are like, okay, but I don't care about money. I'm sick of you capitalists. You know, I care about the environment and I care about social progress. Well, we have the social progress index, which exists. Uh, INCAI's collected all the data in Latin America. It exists globally, and the Social Progress Index isn't looking at economic factors. It's looking at social and environmental factors. And you see that whatever factor you're looking at in Latin America, measures of corruption are highly correlated with social progress of a country. And that is a first critical step that has to be made. We have to get this out of the world of being bad and morality. This is not what it is. All of us are capable under the right circumstances to act in a corrupt way. This is not about being good or bad. This is about changing systems of information and decision-making rules and, and incentives in order to reduce corruption from happening. A lot of the students will say, even if they believe there is a relationship between competitiveness and corruption, they'll still say, but the corruption index is meaningless. It's just perceptions. It's not really corruption. And in fact, many people will argue that the reason why my country is deemed so corrupt is because we talk about corruption so much and we care about it so much that we just have raised awareness that corruption exists. So in fact, the fact that I score so poorly means I'm actually kind of a clean country. What is fascinating to me as a start is just looking at the correlation between the new CCC index and the Transparency International Corruption Index. Thanks for 
Yeah, but I, I mean, there's only eight data points. You couldn't publish this in terms of being methodologically sound, but I can already tell what's going to happen is that you're going to see a very clear and strong relationship between how clean a country is and how able they are to fight corruption, which is lending credibility to the uh, corruption index as a whole. So what we have here is an excellent uh, way of determining a country's ability to fight the corruption that they have in the country. And what I find perfectly exciting about this is the attitude, even among experts, is often, woe is me, throw your hands up and say you don't know where to start. And what this index does is it gives you three dimensions on which a country or individuals within the country trying to fight it would be able to begin to start. So you've got the three different dimensions, I'm sorry, on social progress, it's not up there. But when you look at it, it's giving policymakers and people who care about corruption a sense of where you could actually start if you want to do something about corruption. And the most exciting thing I feel about this index is from a methodological standpoint, we could start looking at correlations between how countries perform on those measures and uh, correlations with GDP and competitiveness. So we could find out what of these factors that you mentioned, 12 of them, the three different dimensions, which are most important. I'm not saying that they're not all important, but if you really wanted a razor sharp analysis of what's the most effective bang for your buck with your money, if you're trying to improve capacity to fight corruption, this type of index gives us the tools to do that. So for a couple of reasons, I'm just thrilled to be here, and this index is going to be a huge asset for people in, uh, well, for sure academics, but anybody in policy in order to figure out where to begin and, and how in fighting corruption. And why do we want to fight corruption? The narrative we're trying to push is it's not because it's bad. We're fighting corruption because it's preventing firms and countries from being competitive. Um, yes, and, and I think for us is always a challenge uh, to connect, you know, an abstract index to people's reality, and that's why we we wanted to to, to bring Susan here, um, and particularly to look at you know how anti-corruption impacts the business environment. I always think that the most interesting part of the council's uh, events are the Q and A sessions, and uh, we would love to hear from you and. Let me remind you that starting now, the, the, the cameras will be turned off.